Good morning and welcome to Faith United Church of Christ. A special welcome to any new or newish folks among us. We pray that you will all find here a community of open minded and open hearted people. Please know you are welcome here no matter what you believe, what you look like, or who you love, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey. Rejoice, heavenly powers. Sing choirs of angels. Exalt all creation around God's throne. Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ our King, King is risen. Alleluia. Amen. Let us immerse ourselves in the silence at the center of our lives and at the center of our universe. Let us open anew to the still small voice. God, meet us afresh in this hour of worship and renewal. Touch us where we most need your tender touch. Fill that which is empty. Empty that which is full. Work your way around and through any doubts that our faith might grow ever more robust and verdant so that we might be an ever clearer channel of your love in the world. Amen. Time for the rainbow, rainbow pants. Hi, Jesus. Hi, Jesus. I think Pastor, I think Pastor Rainbow Pants is asleep. Should I go wake him up? No, let him sleep. 
You and I can do his part of the service today. He was up too late planning the next video. Sometimes I have my doubts about him. Funny you should mention doubts, Becca. Did you know that the story for today is about my disciple Thomas? Some people call him Doubting Thomas. Why do they call him that? After the first Easter, I went to see my disciples, and he was out getting them some food. I had to leave after a while, and when he came back, they told him I was there. But he doubted their story and said, Alas, I see the holes in his hands and put my finger in his side. I won't believe it. Oh, boy, did you yell at him when you saw him for not believing him? No, Becca, I did not yell at him. Everyone has doubts at times, Becca. And because he was honest with his doubts, when I came back to see him, I told him, come, look at my hands. Come here, touch my side where I had my wound. You mean sometimes when things are bad and I wonder if God is real, it's okay? It doesn't make God mad? It doesn't make you mad? No, Becca. I know everyone has doubts. I'm glad when people are honest about them. And just like with Thomas, I'll try to answer their questions. One of my great friends, the Zen master, said, Great faith requires great doubt. You see, Becca, doubt is a requirement for a really strong faith in God. Wow, I can't wait to tell Pastor Rainbow Pants the story of Doubting Thomas. <sniffs> oh boy, there's him snoring now. I guess I better wait until he wakes up. I guess so. Let's go get some breakfast. That was Pastor Rain. That was Jesus and Becca the Gecko. Back to you. Now we hear from Rob West. Thank you, Rob. Beautiful. We come now to our time of community prayer, and I'll go through the prayer list as it currently stands. My apologies if we leave anyone out. 
And again, just an encouragement for you to either email Brian or Faith or myself with any um, updates or new prayer requests. We continue to pray for both Denny Wetter and Jean Cox, also for Vicki and Ken Followell and the family of their friend Jim. Uh, Jim passed away this past week, so we think of his folks. For Nancy Richmond, still struggling with labyrinthitis, but they did change the medication and she's hoping she's seeing some improvement. For Brian's aunt's husband, Hubert, who is ill. For Dorothy Gallo, having had her heart oblation on Thursday uh, and is recovering at home and also for Dorothy's best friend with quickly progressing dementia and her son-in-law who continues to undergo cancer treatment. We'll pray for Blue's friend Steve, also continuing with cancer treatment. Um, we celebrate the blessing that Joan Sheehan's son Darren has turned the corner and is doing much better. He is back at home now. Um, the whole family continues to quarantine, but he's doing better. And we're also going to celebrate the blessing of Joan's birthday. I think it's this Tuesday, her 89th birthday. So we celebrate with Joan Sheehan. <clears throat> we'll continue to pray for Janice Roth, who um, is also continuing to recover from her heart procedure and is now looking at an additional one as well. They're talking about doing an oblation, which is what Dorothy had. So we pray for Janice and for the doctors and the nurses. For um, our friend Nicole, who is a frontline COVID nurse in Minneapolis, also Ken and Vicki's niece and her significant other, and for all medical professionals, risking their lives for us. We remember Cheryl Overheight Smith's aunt and uncle, Louise and Bob Overheight. They were placed in a nursing home facility last week. They've been married for 70 years and are separated right now in the facility. He's in assisted living and she's on the memory care unit. They can't see each other because of the virus and this has been very traumatic especially for Cheryl's uncle. They are folks of extremely strong faith and value prayer so much. We'll continue to pray for PJ, who took a fall this week and hit her head, but apparently is doing well. Um, for the carpenters, whose neighbors both died of COVID-19 a week or so ago. Brian? On this, the 50th anniversary tomorrow of the May 4th shootings, want to remember the families that still remember those they lost. Yes, tomorrow is the 50th anniversary of the May 4th shootings at Kent State. So we pray for those families who continue to remember their lost children. Let us join our hearts in prayer. Spirit of God, you are stirring in our hearts. You urge us to get going. You prompt us to follow. You encourage us not to give up. You call us to open our minds and our hearts to receive your energizing, transforming radiance. Make us receptive so that we will follow your lovely, loving movement within our lives. And we trust in your powerful presence within us. And we offer unto your powerful presence all of those we have named today. We know that you hold them close to your heart 
continue to work each one's highest good. We pray these and all our prayers in the name of Christ and as he taught us saying, our oh, Father, Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Dorothy will now share the scripture with us. The scripture today is John 20, verses 19 through 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the authorities, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. You forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house. Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other things in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and through believing you may have life in his name. Amen. Today's scripture from the Gospel of John, the passage we've come to think of as the story of Doubting Thomas, is one of my favorites. We missed it this year in our lectionary rotation because it came up the week we celebrated Earth Day, so I decided to go back and grab it. You see, the story especially speaks to me because I too am by nature something of a Doubting Thomas. It's part of the reason that I'm in the UCC. We do not have to check our brains at the door and I'm allowed to have doubts. Indeed, we take comfort in the words of that Zen master who did say, great faith assumes great doubt. I remember when it all started for me, I was very young and attending Catholic school and I believed in God without question. But I remember the day my critical thinking kicked in and I began to struggle with what would become a lifelong companion, doubt. I think I was in about sixth grade. I was a student at St. Joan of Arc Elementary School in Chagrin Falls, Ohio, where my mother was a teacher. I went to her classroom after school to wait for her before we would drive home. I remember looking at one of the bulletin boards with the pictures of Jesus on it, and suddenly for the first time thinking, how do they know he actually looked like that? From there, it quickly went to, how do they actually know he said or did anything they say he said or did? 
And finally, what if it was all just a huge exaggeration based on what people want to believe? And I have to tell you that pretty much from that day on, faith has not come particularly easy for me. Once my critical thinking mode kicked in, it kicked in in a big way. I've always been somewhat like Thomas, needing at least some modicum of logic and reason before adapting a firm belief. I suppose it was that need that drove me to go to seminary a decade or so later. And what I have learned since then is that while in the end, there is a large element of just having to take the leap of faith, there's also, um, there also are some arguments, some lines of thought that have helped me come to at least a li livable truce with my tendency to doubt. So I share those with you this morning as one doubting Thomas who has found enough evidence not to be certain every minute, but to cast my lot on the side of faith and to stay the course even when doubts come in. The first argument that really spoke to me begins with the observation that as humans, we appear to be innately hardwired with a hunger for eternity. At a very basic existential level, we seem to be built such that we cannot really experientially comprehend the idea of our own non-existence. Theologian Paul Tillich calls it the inability of being to contemplate non-being. I know we can theoretically think of a future for the world after we've died, but at a core level, we seem unable to wrap our minds around what it will be like for us not to exist. This gets expressed in all kinds of ways. We say things like, if I die, I want thus and such at my funeral, as if there's some question in the matter. Deep down, at a raw emotional level, we kind of believe death happens to the other guy, but maybe not to us. And even if we do work through that innate denial, somehow death still bothers us. There's something hardwired into every one of us that longs for eternal life that would like more eternal life that would like more than anything to skip the great unknown of death and live forever happily. And this survival instinct, this hunger for eternity is a strong and compelling force. Well, here's the argument says theologian C.S. Lewis. Just as hunger implies that there is such a thing as food, and just as thirst is the best argument for the existence of water, so this passion for immortality is itself the strongest argument that there must be some sort of satisfaction for it. Why would we be hardwired for eternal life if there weren't some satisfaction for that longing. And we can't just dismiss it by calling it the survival instinct either. Simply naming a thing doesn't explain it away. If this existence were all there is, why would we be haunted by intimations of more? Why would we have those unexplained longings those vague experiences and intuitions that point to a mystery that is so much larger than we are. There seems to be a wider universe out there that occasionally bleeds through. And not only is it out there, but also inside of each one of us with longings and hungerings for meaning and purpose and eternity. If there were no satisfaction for that hunger, why would we have wired into us at the most basic level the hunger in the first place? A second argument is related. In addition to being hardwired with a hunger for eternity, we also seem to be hardwired with a, a hunger for fairness, for justice. 
Just last week, my five-year-old great-niece, Molly, announced unprompted that rich people should share because that isn't fair. She and her mom weren't even discussing it, but she had been thinking about it. Instead, <clears throat> uh, indeed, from our earliest experience in life, as toddlers arguing over the way mom cut the birthday cake, we have a powerfully innate sense that things should be fair. And yet, as we all know, because we've heard it a million times from our parents, life is not fair. And it's true that if this existence, as we know it, is all there is, then life is so inherently unfair as to be, frankly, obscene. Unless there is some restoration at the end, how do we make any sense of the fact that some people are born smart and capable and privileged, while others are born into the chronic struggle of mental, emotional, or physical disability. If this is all there is, how do we begin to square our innate hunger for justice with the fact that some babies get born into loving families and others into hate-based genocide? It seems to me that if there were no sense of reconciliation of these inequities, no healing of this immensely broken system at the end, then we shouldn't have innately bred into us such a hunger for that healing, such a passion for justice. Finally, thirdly, we seem to observe in the universe some sort of force that wants us to move forward individually and as a species. We have within us an innate resiliency that keeps us from just giving up when we're down. It is that thing that makes us get up when we fall and keep trying, even if we have fallen over and over. There seems to be some kind of life force that wants to work with us and help us, sort of like our immune system or the impulse toward evolution a force for healing and growth that keeps nagging at us to continue the struggle. Scott Peck calls this grace, and he means it not so much in the traditional theological sense, but as the force that keeps pushing the universe and each of us individually forward into something better and more whole. This innate hunger for wholeness, again, is itself an argument that there is more wholeness to be achieved, that something wants us to keep on keeping on. We seem to have hardwired into us then these three longings, the longing for eternity, the longing for justice, and the longing for personal and universal transformation into wholeness. And the hunger for each of these things is itself a strong argument that there must exist somehow, some way, some kind of satisfaction for those hungers. And for me, that satisfaction, that object of my longing, is best explained by a mysterious, loving presence, a life force at the very least, which hardwired the human species to have those longings in the first place and which keeps nurturing us along and up a path of evolution, both physical and spiritual. And for me then, it's not such a big step to go from a loving life force behind it all to a personal God. And then to that God's chosen manifestation in the form of Jesus of Nazareth, who embodies those three things we most long for, and who came to personify that loving life force. He came to reveal to us the way of ongoing spiritual transformation, such that we too slowly transform into eternal beings of wholeness and love, eventually taking our place in a world where all has been brought to rights where all shall be well and every tear shall be wiped away 
and we shall see no longer through a glass darkly, but clearly and face to face. That, in a nutshell, is why I believe. That and the dozens of hospice deaths I've attended over the years, where it was more the norm than the exception for those making the transition through the veil of death, to see something I couldn't see, something beautiful and whole and loving and compelling, something that caused them almost to a person to look into the upper corner of the room and raise their hands and seem to reach for another world to which they appeared to be being drawn. I still have some times of doubt, and here's a big secret. I suspect everybody does, even the Pope. There is not a believer on earth, even the most dogmatic fundamentalist, who doesn't at one time or another wonder if it isn't all poppycock. So if you fit that description as someone who has ever doubted or someone who makes a lifestyle of it, have no fear. It is a perfectly normal function of being human, and it's a part of belief. So yes, I still have moments of doubt, but they no longer eat at me like they used to. And by grace, I have times of extreme certainty too. Times when I am grasped at a deep emotional level by a sense of grace and strength and wisdom and love that is so much larger than I and which provide a different way of knowing that indeed all shall be well. These moments are not all that frequent, but they do happen. There are little glimpses for each of us doubting Thomases, for each of us whose faith is so often flimsy and frail and who struggle with our feet of clay humanity on a daily basis. Former Cleveland Bishop James Pilla, in an address to young men about to be ordained, said it this way, Christ is not just for those who are convinced, but for those who, like Peter, wonder why they lose heart and begin to sink. Christ is for those who, like Thomas, know what they are capable of and who try mightily to salvage a few sacred moments in a life of so many ambiguous years. So if, like me, you tend to be a Thomas, do take heart. Even though Jesus blessed those who didn't need proof, let's not overlook the fact that he also came to Thomas on Thomas's own terms. It was but a moment in a life of ambiguity, but it was a moment nonetheless. I believe there is a moment for each of us, or if not a moment, then a slow, dramatic, non-dramatic process wherein the scales can gradually be tipped and one finds oneself more often on the side of faith than doubt. And as the character says in the magnificent closing scene of the movie Hannah and Her Sisters, where he finally comes to a tenuous faith himself, it's a pretty slender read to hang your whole life on, but maybe that's all we get. And what that character may or may not have known is that the book of Isaiah says, a slender reed our God will not break, and a flickering candle our God will not extinguish. God has worked with less than these after all. So if you are a doubter or maybe an outright disbeliever, might I suggest that you just try to stay open. Maybe read this sermon more than once if I may be so presumptuous, or better yet, read the last section of the Peck book I referenced, The Road Less Traveled, or C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity, some, not all, of which I highly recommend. The point is to engage the struggle, to ask, even hypothetically, to ask the universe, ask God for help. 
come and talk with me and let's look at your doubts together. Maybe you too will be shown the scars. Maybe you too will be met by God in exactly the way you need it to happen. Not that you'll be given absolute certainty for whatever reason that just doesn't seem to be part of the program. But I believe that if you seriously engage the struggle, you will be given plenty enough to go on. Ultimately though, the bottom line is, you'll never know unless you leap. Amen. I remind people to get their communion elements ready as Carly leads us in our hymn of meditation. night so long ago Jesus gathered with his disciples for the Passover feast they were around the table it is indeed a feast of many specific foods ritual foods one of which is the unleavened bread that night Jesus took one of the pieces during the meal blessed it Blessed are you, O God, ruler of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And then he broke it, saying, This is my body, broken for you. Let us share together now in the partaking of the bread. Carly will sing another verse. Jesus grabbing the Elijah cup, the one cup still full after the full meal. He also blessed it. Barukata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olem Horai Peri Hagafen. Blessed are you, O God, ruler of the universe, who brings forth the fruit of the vine. And afterwards he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink. This is my blood in the new covenant shed for you as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup you remember me until i come again let us receive together now the cup of blessing as father's things Child. 
and let us pray. We are grateful, God, for this meal, for this remembering of you together. Though we are in many places and far apart, we know in the heart of your love we are together. We are close. In your spirit, we are indeed one. Thank you for this meal of remembrance. We ask you to help us to follow the one who first shared this meal. Jesus, in his name do we pray. Amen. We share with one another now opportunities to give of time and talent in the coming week. I'm, uh, I'm going to put the communion elements there and I'm going to put an unusual thing up here. This is a, a tub full of plastic bags. Someone was very generous and responded to our request for plastic bags at church. Uh, we're gonna take your bags that you brought them uh, back to church. It'll be in the tub if you'd like to pick them up there. And this is what we mean by flat. Uh, if you bring them, if you have time at night to flatten them out, this is how they use them at Downtown Ministries. Uh, well, okay, I told I showed them this way. They're just stacked like this flat in a box. That's, that's how they best use them. They store them all in big tubs. Um, and just a reminder too, the, uh, the SAM committee is willing to pick up plastic bags or food that you might want to donate to the uh, food pantry. If you'll give Babs Brownell a call, she will arrange for one of the members to pick it up. Also, uh, we have collection uh, tubs for, for plastic bags and for food. The big yellow tub is at the church. It's outside on, on the um, entryway there when Faith is in the office, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, nine to noon, and Tuesday and Thursday, one to four couple of events coming up that are new, uh, not this Friday, but the following Friday will be our first, uh, uh oh, what's it called? It's called Church Chat <laughs> on uh, Friday at seven o'clock. Um, that will be, in fact, maybe it's three Fridays. Now that now I didn't check that before I started, but look for that coming up. That'll be at seven o'clock. That's just Similar to spirits and spirituality, but just a little bit lighter in its questions, more uh, socializing. Uh, also, uh, at the end of the month, May 30th, will be a Saturday morning uh, similar thing called Coffee Time. And that will be at 10 o'clock. You can drink coffee or tea or whatever you might like. Chocolate milkshakes are accepted. Uh, and that, too, will be an informal time of getting together. Anything else you to share on that? All right. Well, then, uh, thank you again for your continued um, offerings via the Internet, via the U.S. Postal Service. Um, we continue to do work and to uh, share together in this ministry. So um, at one final note I just want to mention. The uh, Florida Conference of the United Church of Christ um, at a, uh, a meeting of the uh, conference uh, ministers and other staff of other churches has recommended uh, that we not meet together uh, through the month of May. And the council felt that uh, their recommendation would be the best thing to follow based on uh, medical things. So at this point, we will continue to meet this way uh, through May, and we will, the council will decide about June at their next meeting. I see somebody waving. Mary, do you have a question about that, or were you just swatting at, oh no, that was Sylvia. Wave again if you need to talk, Sylvia. Okay, <laughs> all right. Let us continue in our worship now by receiving our offerings. And Carly will be playing. Carly, you might be muted. Sorry. Okay. <laughs>
Let us join now in our doxology together. body of Christ, remember that you are his hands and his side, and that by looking at your life, others will see proof of the resurrection. Go in peace to love and serve our risen Lord. Amen. <laughs> 